So my friend uh, Nick Van Ortis, uh, I teach him as adjunct faculty, so I know how I got the assignment, uh, asked me to say a few words about Alan Bromley, and, as well as to introduce John Holdren. It's very special for me to be able to do this. Um, Alan and John are two of the most successful presidential science advisors in recent times, so I'm honored to be able to speak about both of them. Uh, first, a few words about Alan Bromley. Um, his background, Alan, of course, was Canadian by birth, and he was born in Westmeath, Ontario. Studied at Queen's University, got his PhD in physics from Rochester. Taught there, then worked for the uh, Atomic Energy of Canada uh, as both a senior researcher and a section head. And then went to Yale as a professor. And he founded and ran the Wright Nuclear Structure Lab there. Then he became chairman of the physics department in 1972. Um, he is really considered the father of heavy ion science, uh, and he made pioneering contributions in, in the area of atomic nuclei. Uh, he was awarded the Presidential Medal of Science in 1988 for this work. Uh, so from 1989 to 1993, he then moved to OSTP as President's, President Bush's science advisor. Uh, among many initiatives, he battled for science funding increases, successfully, I might add, in light of the manufacturing and technology challenges that the U.S. then faced. Um, he also supported work on high-speed internet and a host of other fields that were evolving at the time. I got to know Alan, excuse me, Dr. Bromley, I, at the Alan part came later, when I was working on Capitol Hill. There's a, there's a rule on Capitol Hill. If two principals have a meeting, and there are no staff present, the meeting did not occur. <laughs> uh, so I was used to make sure the meeting occurred by being the present staff. Um, and Alan, you know, impressed me from the outset. Uh, most scientists, when they visit Congress, they look like they're accompanying Dante to the inferno. Um, they're so uncomfortable, and you can just, you just know what's happening. I mean, the scientists, understand the scientific method, and they have to deal with these political junkies. If there's two fields that are less comparable, those are, those are the fields. Uh, and you can just see them thinking, this is the seventh layer of hell, and then the next meeting, this is the sixth layer of hell. Um, but Alan, Alan was different, and you know, in his uh, kind of endless bow ties, which he always sported, and his blue pinstripe suits, he had just had such a jaunty spirit to him. Um, you know, he didn't belong in hell, but he was obviously delighted to be in hell, and he liked hell, and, you know, we liked him. Um, he, um, it was another period of the collapse of U.S. manufacturing, sound familiar? Uh, but Alan, unlike many, frankly, in his administration, actually talked about how the U.S. faced profound competitive challenges, and thought and worked on how to deal with those. Um, in his OSTP role, he took very important steps, very important to science, uh, to elevate the role of the science advisor, to which we are in his debt for. Um, he had cabinet rank as the president's advisor for science and technology. He attended cabinet meetings. He attended the daily White House senior staff meetings. Um, those are signals of authority in Washington. John, of course, shares those. Um, although the presidential science advisory system was disbanded in 1972, Dr. Bromley persuaded President Bush, the first President Bush, to reactivate. He established PCAST with very prominent scientists and industry leaders, and he really used those meetings to get advice, and that group met with the President on a number of, number of occasions. Um, historically, really, for the first time since, uh, you know, Vannevar Bush and Roosevelt and Killian and Eisenhower and Jerry Wiesner and Kennedy, science was sort of right in the door of the president again. Um, he was the first to issue a joint guidance memo with the director of OMB regarding administration priorities uh, for science and technology budgets. Um, he made the fix-it system, the interagency committee structure, work by insisting that the agency heads or their deputies be represented on these committees and that OMB, there is, OMB be there as well, which meant there was real authority in those committees. Um, he saw climate change as an issue, and the U.S. Global Change Research Program obviously has been quite successful over, over time, and it began with leadership from OMB and OSTP under Dr. Bromley. 
He was the first director of OSTP to have an assistant director for social sciences. Uh, one of his initiatives was the establishment of the International Science Mega Project. Uh, his concept there was that U.S. should develop these projects up front with other countries, not deliver them wholly formed and ask for funding later. Um, and in light of the cost of many science fields of big science, that step has been an important one. Um, so many of Dr. Bromley's OSTP best practices remain key cornerstones for OSTP today. I got to know him especially when he returned to be Dean of Engineering at Yale. Um, Yale's president, Rick Levin, was a growth economist and saw the importance of science, and he asked Alan to lead a revival of physical science and engineering um, at Yale. And Yale's renewed strength in these fields uh, is in significant part testimony to the groundwork that Alan laid before his death in 2005. So I'll close with one of my favorite uh, Bromley-isms before I introduce John. Uh, planning a trip with European science leaders, his OSTP staff was going crazy. How were they going to find a hotel in Paris that would fit with the government per diem travel allowance? <laughs> Alas, Alan wanted to stay at his favorite hotel, the George V. His staff countered with, Dr. Bromley, there's so many small, charming hotels on the left bank. Dripping with irony, Alan came back with a motto for us all. I'm not into charm, I'm into comfort. <laughs> His staff was very fond of him. Now, it's a special privilege to turn to John Holdren, advisor to the President for Science and Technology, director of OSTP, co-chair of PCAST. John was Heinz Professor of Environmental Policy at the Kennedy School at Harvard before coming to the White House. Um, he directed the Science, Technology, Public Policy Program at the Belfer Center there, and he was director of Woods Hole. Born not far from Pittsburgh, uh, raised in San Mateo, California, he studied aeronautics, astronomics, plasma physics with an SB from MIT and a PhD uh, from Berkeley. He, excuse me, Stanford, John. Uh, he taught, <laughs> excuse me. He taught at Harvard for 13 years and taught at Berkeley for over two decades. His work has focused on the causes and consequences of global environmental change, on energy technologies and policies, and early, uh, early before that, on ways to reduce the danger from nuclear weapons and materials. He has been a pioneer in the expanding field of science and technology policy throughout his career. Um, he has advised President Obama on what was the largest increase in R&D funding in 2009 since Sputnik. Um, and on the remarkable expansion of energy R&D, and he has led in trying to persuade the nation to confront the climate challenge. You know, we now face a different era in science funding, but despite adamant calls for cutbacks this year, the FY 2011 funding for science was remarkably steady, and we have John and his strong and thoughtful relationship with the president to thank for that. There are many things in the works at his very activist, very busy OSTP. The nation finally has a strategy for American innovation uh, with ongoing updates. There is a major position on scientific integrity that's been issued. Uh, we have a global science diplomacy effort. Major initiatives have begun in, begun in STEM education in cooperation with industry. And PCAST has many projects pending, maybe the most activist PCAST I've ever seen, including on the future of manufacturing and strengthening the research university. So we have an OSTP under John with a truly big picture and the ear of the president. Let me turn to John now for the Bromley Memorial Lecture. Thank you.